Red Glass by Laura Rousseau Chapter 12, Section 2 The first day, Dika and I helped the grandmother and aunts strip kernels off dried corn cobs. We sat on small wooden chairs and woven mats in the open area between the bedroom shack and the kitchen, slowly filling buckets. The women constantly warned me, Despacio, Guerra, despacio. Careful, white girl. They insisted if I pushed myself too much, I'd get blisters because my hands weren't used to work. We took a break at midday and Abuelita, she told me to call her grandma once she found out I'd never met my own grandmothers, handed me and Dika each a boiled sweet potato that she dug up earlier that day. She peeled hers with bare fingers just after she'd plucked it from the boiling water. Her finger skin was thick as leather gloves, so tough she didn't get burned. But my potato stung my fingertips. I dropped it on my lap and waited for it to cool while my mouth watered. Abuelita laughed a belly laugh and took my hands in hers. Manos tiernas, she announced, and held my tender hands out for her daughters to see. Abuelita peeled my potato and handed it to me. I didn't worry about germs because I was so hungry and the potato smelled so good and sweet. Si, sí, senora, Dika said, we must make Sophie strong. This girl has so many allergies and rashes and sunburn. Always one thing or another with her. Muy delicada, Abuelita nodded. Muy pero muy delicada, Dika agreed. Suddenly, I felt tired of being Sophie la delicada. Tired of making circles inside a fishbowl, watching life through cloudy glass. Would I ever be Sophie La Fuerte, the strong one, a salmon swimming up waterfalls, leaping over dams? Or better yet, one of those butterflies that goes from Canada through winds and storms all the way to Mexico with its velvety wings intact? After the potatoes, we went back to the corn, and as Dika and the grandmother and aunts talked, the burlap sacks of corn cobs grew emptier and the buckets of kernels grew fuller. I plunged my hands deep into the buckets, felt the kernels in my hands, hard and smooth as little pearls. Their colors filled me up purple and orange and red and yellow like the insides of a seashell. Later, Abuelita boiled the kernels with water and crushed limestone until the skins came off, and then we headed to the Malino, the grinding machine, down the road. We took turns carrying the two heavy buckets. The metal handle dug into my hand and my arm felt as if it might fall off. Be tough. I told myself, be fuerte, and shifted the bucket to my other hand. We walked down the dirt road past some other shacks where women were washing clothes. They waved and called out, buenos dias, and looked curiously at me and Dika, a strange sight in the village. A few women ventured closer with bewildered smiles and questions. ¿Quiénes son? They asked Abuelita, gesturing to us with their chins. Who are they? She smiled big. My dear sister and my darling niece. The women looked at one another, confused. They offered hesitant smiles. Abuelita said briskly that we had to be going. Ramano, sister. Come on, niece. We continued on our way, lugging the buckets, and when we rounded the corner, Dika and Abuelita and the ants burst out laughing. Ay, did you see her face when I called you sister? They threw their arms around each other and doubled over, gasping and howling and wiping tears from their faces. They kept snickering down the muddy path to the village center, which was a big square patch of weeds with a cathedral on one side, 
a cement block building for the mayor's office on the opposite side, a small store with a phone booth on the third side, and the Molino in a tiny adobe house to close the square. At the Molino, we dump the boiled corn into the grinder, and moments later, a giant mound of dough plopped out. When the owner of the Molino asked about me and Dika, Abuelita gave her the same story, and this time, she and Dika laughed even harder. Next, we stopped at the phone booth where Dika and I took turns talking to Mom and Juan. Neither of us mentioned the police encounter or the fireworks scare or the fact that Angel's mom might still be alive. Dika seemed to have forgotten about all that anyway. Drunk on her burgeoning friendship with Abuelita, she gushed about how wonderful life was here, how we might stay an extra week. When I talked to mom, she tried to sound casual, but I heard the caution between her words. So, how have you been feeling, Sophie? She was really asking if I'd freaked out yet. Good, mom. Really? She asked, trying to hide her surprise. But have you, you know, have you been worrying or? No, I said, my voice strong. I'm good. And then she asked a few questions about food and the weather and put Juan on the phone and he asked about the food and the weather and we all took turns talking about the food and weather. Later at home, Abuelita and the ants ground the corn dough on the stone metate, then patted out little balls and patted them out into flat circles. The tortillas cooked on a clay plate over the fire and everyone but me turn them with their fingers. The ants didn't want me to flip the tortillas because of my manos tiernas. But finally I burst out, how will my hands get tough if I never try? So they let me. And sure enough, my fingertips got burned, but I bit my tongue and blinked back the tears and told myself that pain was a step to strength. Meanwhile, that first day, Pablo played with his cousins near the river while Angel and Mr. Lorenzo worked with Pablo's uncles in the cornfields. In the afternoon, they came back from the field smelling of sunshine and sweat and soil. After a late lunch, the men played basketball while Pablo and I watched. It wasn't until nighttime, after chamomile tea and sugary pastries, that I got a chance to be alone with Angel in the hour before bed. We followed the same routine every day for nearly a week. The days blended together. Some afternoons it rained, quick thunderstorms, but mostly it was clear-skied and gentle. I liked losing track, feeling that we were in a timeless place. Sometimes during the day, music blared from speakers in the village center. Cumbia and merengue and salsa the same three albums played over and over again. Some songs I liked and found myself singing along with Mi pongo a trabajar, mi pongo a trabajar. I put myself to work and everyone in the village was hard at work. All the women were making tortillas. You could tell by the wood smoke rising from chimneys throughout the valley. I liked knowing that the men in the fields were hearing the same songs, Angel especially. My favorite song was Siguendo la Luna, Following the Moon, which we'd heard in the van. That song transported me back in time, into the van, inside that cozy space with the song playing and angel mouthing the words, watching the moon through the window. Strange how you can get nostalgic about something that happened only a week earlier.